You see, I would call it a left hand tool because normal tools are right hand, but it's facing left, which would make it a left hand tool. Maybe one's Canadian, or maybe one of them is metric. So which, hmm. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Axe. Single point cutting internal threads. That's a phrase that strikes fear into the heart of many a home shop machinist, but I'm going to show you that you can do it. Well, not you. You've got a bad attitude, but everyone else can do it. The fundamentals of single point thread cutting internal threads is the same as for external threads, but each step has a little twist on it, and the whole process is 37% more terrifying. To that end, you definitely want to learn external thread cutting first. I'll link to my video on that topic below. For this video, I'm going to assume you're familiar with the basics of that process. To start with, we're going to need an internal threading tool. I've got a left hand one and a right hand one. I actually don't know which is which, but this one is sort of the normal one, and then this one is an unusual one that I'll explain at the end here. And you can see it's got clearances underneath and on the ends. Now, of course, thread cutting inserts are also a thing, so if your hole is large enough to accommodate that, that's an easy way to skip some of these next steps. Now, you can buy these, of course, but I'll show you how to grind one just in case you want to do that. So I've started with a split blank. This is a piece of carbide that's been split at the ends from the factory. Saves you a lot of grinding dust. So I'll put some layout blue on there and just lay out the tool that I want to grind for this. I usually just use my fishtail gauge and trace it. And these lines are just a template for roughing it in. The lines just let you get close to your goal with the grinding. I've got a bunch of material to remove in the clearance area behind the threading tool, so I'll start by roughing that in on the bench grinder. The bench grinder is a very coarse tool, but it will get us kind of in the ballpark here and save us a bunch of time for the next step. So I'm just kind of hollowing out the main shank area there and kind of getting the very vague idea of the point there. You can see this is all very rough, but you can still see my lines on top, and we're close enough now that we can bring in the big guns, and that's the D-bit grinder. Now, I'm going to do this on the D-bit grinder because I have one and I'm a fancy lass like that, but you can also do this with a Dremel with a diamond wheel on it, or those little grinding stones you can get for Dremels. The point is, you don't have to have a D-bit grinder to do this. Now, if you are going to use one of those other methods, I would suggest using high-speed steel and not carbide. Grinding carbide without proper carbide grinding tools is no fun at all. I start by plunge grinding the area behind the thread cutting point there just to clean up the rough grinder marks there and even that all out. I'm also adding a little bit of clearance there so the tool is at a 10 degree angle. So I'm cutting the clearance on the underside of the flat area. Then I switch to the outside edge of the actual thread cutting point and I'm cutting that also with the clearance angle underneath at the same time. Next, I move to the end clearance. Make sure I've got, again, a 10 degree angle under the end of the cutter there so that we can get in close to inside shoulders and things inside of a part. You'll note that I'm using magnification and lots and lots of light. That's really key for these tiny grinding jobs. With magnification, you really can see those lines and grind right up to them very precisely. I also wear a respirator for all grinding operations. A lot more dust is coming off of this than you think there is, and that's going to sit in your lungs forever. Then the inside of the thread cutting point is the one angle I can't do with the work head on the D-bit grinder. There's no way to contort it into the angle that I need to do this. It will go to negative 30 degrees, but not negative 60 as I need here. So I just do this by hand. And again, just take your time, go slow. This is a 600 grit diamond wheel, so you have lots of time to check your work against the fishtail gauge as you go. I ground the other one basically the same way, but D-bit grinder work heads are not really set up for left hand cutting tools, but pro tip, you can do them upside down in the work head and get most of your angles that way. Let's prep the stock next. I happen to have this piece with a hole in it already that's a good size for this demonstration, but I'm going to open it up a little bit here with my boring bar. You would normally start with a drill and or boring. You want to get this to the tap drill size for the thread if it was going to be tapped with a hand tap. If you don't know the tap drill size, you can also look in Machinery's handbook, and it will give you the tolerance range for the minor diameter of the internal version of this thread, and that'll tell you what dimension you need to hit. 
If you're wondering why my lathe sounds like a goat trapped in a cement mixer full of loose change, it's because I already have the threading gear set on the change gears there. I'm doing a bunch of threading today and I don't want to keep changing them back and forth, so all the feeding you see here is being done by hand. For your first internal thread, you definitely want to do a through thread. It's much, much less stressful than a blind hole. So make sure your stock is thin enough to be able to do that with the amount of reach that you ground on your threading tool. Next, set your compound angle, and you want to swing it around such that you're feeding in the direction of the cutting edge of the threading tool, just like with external threading. Now, for internal threading, that means swinging it around this way. However, on this lathe, that makes it very difficult to crank, so I'm going to swing it this way instead, which gives me the same angle, just feeding the other way. However, the markings on my compound don't show me the angles on this side, so I'm using the protractor there to set it up. In my external threading video, I noted that the compound's not really necessary for small threads and soft materials, and it really isn't. But on internal threading, I do always use it, and that's because internal threading tools are much, much less rigid. They are the boring bars of the threading world, and so you really want every advantage you can get, including using the compound, which lowers tool pressure. So you want to angle the compound such that the forward edge of the tool is doing the cutting as you feed in. Now, truth be told, if you feed the other way on the compound and the tool's cutting on the back edge, that's frankly fine too, but technically you're supposed to feed forward. Now, because this tool is ground from round stock, I need to get the top of it flat so that the top rake is neutral as you want with threading. For that, I'm using an adjustable square here, and I just line that up and press it down onto the top of the tool, and that flattens it out and gets that thing nice and level. And it's facing backwards while I do this because I also need to set the tool height. If this is your first time using this tool or this tool in this tool holder, then you need to swing it around, point it at your tailstock center, and line it up so that the top surface of that tool is right on center. Just like with external threading, you have to set the alignment of the cutting tool so that the point is square with the work, so that your threads have the correct angle on them. Now, the fishtail gauge often won't fit, though, for small internal threading tools like this, so you can either cut that end off or turn it sideways like this and just use one edge. It's not quite as good, but in a pinch, gets it done. As a reminder, the purpose of this step is in case the grind on your tool is not perfectly square to the shank of the tool. So squaring up your tool post wouldn't work in that case because the point of the thread that you're cutting wouldn't be square to the work. So you want to use the fishtail gauge to get the point square regardless of how good your grind is. Next up is our scratch pass to make sure that the thread cutting gears and or transmission are set correctly. So I'll get some Sharpie in the hole there and then I'll set up to do the scratch pass. So I'm going to feed my tool in here and I'm going to touch off on the surface that we want to put the thread in, just like with external thread cutting. And then I can zero my cross slide right there and put an indicator on my tool post, just like with external threading. And I'm going to zero that as well. So this is our zero point. This is the peak of our threads. Now I can spin up the lathe and watch my threading dial, wait for it to hit the right number and engage the half nut and let it ride. Now the point is basically right on the surface here, so this is our scratch pass. When it gets inside, I unlock the half nut, I push the cross slide in clear of the thread, wind it back out, and there's our scratch pass. So now I can get my thread cutting gauge in there to check it. Now if the thread is too small for you to get the gauge in there, you can also do a little scratch pass on an external part first before you do this, just to make sure that your thread cutting gears are set correctly. That looks good, so now I can pull the cross slide back out to my zero, and if I did my job right, the indicator will be back on zero as well. And now I can use the compound to feed in some depth of cut. I'm gonna go five thousandths for my first pass, just like with an external thread cut, and you'll note that I'm pulling the cross slide towards me there, because of course we're cutting on the near side of the part. And once again, wait for my number on the threading dial, engage it, When it gets through the part to the other side, disengage, push the cross slide in, wind the carriage out, reset to zero, dial in more depth of cut, rinse and repeat. Now you'll note that the lathe is running nice and slow here, only 100 RPM or so, and that's fine, especially for your first cut. That is too slow really for a great surface finish, but it does lower the danger and anxiety of this operation quite a bit because of course we are feeding towards the chuck stopping quite close to it with the half nut engaged, which if you crash the lathe in that state, that's basically the worst kind of crash. 
Crashing with the carriage is one thing, there's a clutch, but with the half nut, the whole machine is physically connected together and you really don't want to crash it in that state. Otherwise, this is the same as external threading at this point. I'm just engaging the half nut at the given point on my threading dial. This being an even numbered thread on my lead screw, I can engage on any whole number or on any half, although the halves on my threading dial aren't marked, so that doesn't help me much. The only difference here is on internal threading, I take lighter cuts and do more passes because again, internal threading tools are inherently less rigid, so more patience is required. I'll do a couple of 5 thou passes in brass at the start when there's almost no engagement of the tool, but then very quickly I go to 2 thou and then 1 thou passes. Internal threads can be tricky to measure. You can't use thread wires like you can with an external thread. So typically I'll just look up what the major and minor diameters of the internal thread are in Machinery's Handbook, and that gives you the distance or the depth of the thread that you need to cut, which you can measure on the indicator on your tool post. Typically you're trying to match a male thread that you already have, and so when I'm getting close to where Machinery's Handbook says it should be, I just start doing test fits. Let's see how we're doing here. That looks close, should be close, and that doesn't quite want to go. It's thinking about possibly forming a committee to start, but it won't go in. So I'll do one more cut, and I also did a spring pass where you do another pass without adjusting the depth of cut, just to take any spring out of the thread cutting tool, hence spring pass. And let's try one more time and see where we're at. And that, I think, has got it. Yep, that threads right in just beautifully. Boy, there's really nothing quite so satisfying as a mating thread that you cut yourself. I really strongly encourage you to try this if you've never single point cut threads on your lathe. There are a few operations that are as satisfying and as sophisticated, yet done with such a simple tool. Once you've got some confidence with a through bore thread, then it's time to move on to a blind hole. And this is a more challenging form of internal threading, obviously, because there's high chance of crashing into things. But this is also where single point internal thread cutting really shines because you can do very shallow threads like this where you could never hope to even get a tap to start in there. You might get one thread in there with a tap, but with single point thread cutting, we can get lots of threads in there sufficient for whatever we need. To aid this, I'm going to bring in the other thread cutting tool that we ground, the offhand or left hand, right hand, I don't know, the other, the odd one that we made. And for this, we're going to start in the middle and feed outwards. I showed the same technique for external threads in my other threading video, but you can do the same technique with internal threads, except that you do have to grind a special tool for it because you have to have one facing the other way. You can also buy offhand thread cutting tools, but they are very, very expensive. As before, we need the tool level and check the height on it. In this case, it's going to be the same because both these tools were ground from the same stock. And now I'm going to feed in all the way to the back and then pull away a little bit for clearance. And then I'm going to set a zero right there on my carriage indicator. And that's going to tell us where to start each pass. And then it's time to put the lathe in reverse. This entire operation is done in reverse. So I don't recommend doing this if you have a threaded spindle and your chuck is threaded on because it might thread itself off doing this. As with the traditional method, I'm going to start by simply touching off on the surface of the work there, and then I'm going to zero my cross slide hand wheel and put an indicator on the tool post and zero that. This is our starting point. This is the minor diameter of the internal thread. And now I'm going to move a little clear and I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom of my hole, the zero that I set on the carriage, and we're going to make a little starting groove in there just using the threading tool itself. If you wanted to be super proper, you'd use an internal grooving tool for this, but yeah, we can cheat a little bit and just use the threading tool. So I just feed straight in a little past where the major diameter of the thread should be, and you can see that we've got a nice little starting groove in there now. Now, if you want to get it closer to the bottom of the hole, you can see that I've wasted some space there. Then you have to grind a smaller point on the threading tool, which limits the depth of threads that you can cut with that tool. For each pass, we feed into zero on the carriage where that groove is, then we can feed in depth of cut with the compound and the tool is just feeding into that open groove so it's not touching the work yet. And then we engage the half nut as before. 
This saves you ever having to plunge the threading tool into the work while you're cutting the thread, which makes for a nicer thread because the tool is always entering from outside the work, which is ideal. After each pass, we wind clear of the work, and then we crank the carriage back to the zero on the carriage indicator so that we know the tool is back in that groove. And then we can dial in the next bit of depth of cut. Be aware that as you feed in depth of cut with the compound, the tool is also moving horizontally slightly. So after a while, you're going to start losing your groove, and you'll need to feed a little past zero on the carriage to stay in that groove before each cut. But you'll be able to feel that when it happens. It's not a big deal. Otherwise, it's the same procedure as before, but you can see that there's no anxiety here because we're feeding away from the blind hole in the chuck, so there's no risk of crashing into anything. When we're feeding in towards the blind hole, we're not under power, we don't have the half nut engaged, and it's really very low risk. And this method is nice for through bores as well. You don't have to only use it on blind holes. It's just generally a very nice way to cut internal threads if your lathe is safe to run in reverse. So now we have basically the same thread we cut before, but with a blind hole and threads almost all the way to the bottom of a blind hole. And this is again something that's pretty difficult to do any other way besides single point internal thread cutting. This method also really shines if you need to cut metric threads with an imperial lead screw or vice versa, because in that case you're keeping the half nut engaged for the entire process, and so this is a safe way to get into the bottom of a blind hole. This is a really valuable skill, a little bit nerve wracking, but definitely something you should try once you've gotten the hang of external single point thread cutting. I hope this video was helpful for setting you down the road of learning this valuable skill. Thank you very much for watching. If you can swing it, throw me a little love there on Patreon. It really means the world to me. It helps me make these videos every week, and I will see you next time.